Hello, friends. Please enjoy my interview with Chris Scruggs, presented by True Tone. Thanks. Well, hello, friends, and welcome to the True Tone Lounge. Today's guest was recently inducted into the Musicians Hall of Fame. He fronts a band called the Stone Fox Five. He has his own radio show on w WSM uh, every Friday night after the Opry called Friends and Neighbors. He's a member of Marty Stewart and the Fabulous Superlatives. He's a session man, played with everyone from, I mean, he's doing sessions with Sierra Farrell currently. Uh, he's worked with everyone from the late Mike Nesmith to former Birds, uh, you know, someone with a, a great musical pedigree, uh, Chris Scruggs. How's it going? Good yeah. to see you, Zach. Well, it's Glad good. to be here. Well, thank you for coming. Yeah. Yeah. So, your mom is Gail Davies. That's right, yeah. And uh, she was a, a huge, you know, groundbreaking artist, as far as, you know, singer-songwriter, producing her own records. And that's kind of the environment you grew up in. You were with her out on the road. You were with her in sessions. And yeah. so you just kind of grew up in it. Is that? Yeah, she was the, the first, um, you know, acknowledged female record producer right. in, in Nashville. And she was the first female staff producer for Liberty Records under Jimmy Bowen. And she produced her own records from the late 70s through the 80s, which a lot of them were hits. And she raised me on her own. So when she would go on the road, I'd have to go with her. So I grew up a lot. Uh, of my childhood was spent on tour buses or, you know, in the lounges or the, the couches in front of the, the board at recording studios. So yeah. that was a lot of my world, you know, growing up was just being around musicians and people making records and, yeah. and putting on shows. So. Did you ever uh, ride on a, on a, an acoustic guitar like it was a horsey or anything like that? I don't think I did that. I used to, you know, pretend that my guitar was a tennis racket, though. I know most kids do it the other way around. They <laughs> right. pretend. But for me, you know, we couldn't afford a tennis racket, so I just had yeah. to use a guitar. So you just had used yeah. hit things with the guitar. Yeah. <laughs> Still do sometimes. Yeah. Right? And what would you what would you do during shows when your mom's putting on a concert? What would you do? I, you know, I'd sit side stage, side stage and watch. You know, yeah. sometimes there'd be somebody on the road who was there to kind of watch after me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was just. And and at what point did you did you start getting involved and it, and it started being something you were actually interested in? When there was a couple of her songs I knew all the words to, so sometimes if it was like a county fair or like a more family friendly show, she'd let me get up on stage and sing with her. And and a few times on TV on the old Nashville Now show with Ralph Emery, you know, I'd get on there sometimes with her, and she'd have me sing along with her, and maybe. Shotgun Red would interview me afterwards or things yeah, there, like that. There's a there's a clip of, of you as a as a child and I think you're doing the Pee Wee Herman dance. The, the, for the tequila. tequila dance yes. from Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> With the Jerry Whitehurst Nashville Now band. <laughs> yes. Backing Very, me up on that. I mean, the, yeah. how, how many how many kids have that? You know? I, I think only one, if you want to get really specific about that, yeah. that particular song and that particular dance. Yeah. The, yeah. Were, was your mom homeschooling you? Were you going to school? No, she's, you know? she quit the road when I started kindergarten. Okay. So, and then she kind of stayed off the road until I was, you know, a little, little bit older. Yeah. So, but there weren't any of your classmates saying, hey, I saw you on Nashville Now last night? No, no, not at that point. I was a little too, yeah. too young. For, I was just before school at that point. So. Yeah. So when did you get, start getting serious about it? Um, I started playing guitar when I was 11. I had a, a drum, a little drum kit when I was small, but I didn't really take it too seriously. Seriously enough that... I have always been able to sit be down behind a drum kit, and my coordination has always been there, and the independence. So I, I can I can play drums, but I never really I, I just could kind of when I was older I just realized oh I I can do this you know. But it was because I'd, I'd done it a lot as a little kid without really thinking about it too much. But I got serious when I was 11. I started playing guitar, and it was because I I saw a Hard Day's Night, and I thought I need to get serious about that. You know, the, I'm not just gonna like know how to play guitar out of nowhere. I have to learn some chords. You know. Yeah. So I learned A and D and E and you know, 
And, and those three still get me by in, on, in a lot of situations. <laughs> well, Sometimes that's still all you need to know. So, yeah. and and when did you start actually gigging? Um, I started. I played guitar, like rhythm guitar, with her when she would go over and play in, in Europe. Some she married a, a guy from from Britain, and and we would stay over there and like have long summers over there, and then tour a lot and play like country festivals in Europe and mm -hmm. the UK. And I would play guitar with her. I guess when I was like 14, I started playing on my own professionally. Um, I started playing on Lower Broadway when I was 16 at uh, what was back then called the Bluegrass Inn. But it wasn't a bluegrass band. It was a rockabilly band. And, uh, and this is the place that's now called Layla's. Same, yeah. same owner, Layla yeah, Bartanian. On, on Broadway. On Broadway. Yeah. But back then it was called the Bluegrass Inn. And it looked very different inside, you know. Um, and I started playing in a rockabilly band with a high school friend of mine on drums, a guy named Matt Arn. Uh, the two of us with various bass players, you know. It was hard to find upright bass players back then. This is the late 90s. Yeah. And there weren't a lot of people who played like that style who could play slap bass, upright slap bass. Um, so we would like find somebody who played guitar and just, you know, Matt had a bass, you know, with gut strings on it. We'd be like, hey, you know, we'd show them how to do it and then... You know, they'd, they'd play with us for a few weeks until their fingers started bleeding, and then we'd have to move on to somebody else until, you know, there just weren't a lot of people playing that way back then. So, so it, it, it sounds like, you know, the, the Beatles and rockabilly music were kind of, you know, formative for you. When did, when did country music start becoming more important to you? I, I guess kind of through the, you know, growing up around country music, you know, there's, and, and when it's the thing that your, your parents are involved in, there's kind of this thing of like you want to be cooler than that, you know. And, yeah. Um, but I, I guess, I guess the the rockabilly thing was just kind of one step removed from that. Especially when you look at who the session musicians are, and you realize that right. Grady Martin and Hank Garland played on just as many rock and roll records as they played on country records. Um, and Buddy Harmon and Bobby Moore and yeah, Floyd like, Kramer like and all that. Johnny Burnett. Yeah, you know, yeah, with, yeah. Um, Grady playing and, and Brenda Lee and Ronnie Self and you know all those rock and roll records that were cut at the Quonset Hut and then maybe later that day they did a, a Webb Pierce session or a Farron Young session you know um, there was that and then also um, just how much respect there was in like the rock and roll world for people like George Jones and you know and you know that that sort of outlaw bad boy country thing that I think rockers always. Uh, respected, you know, when you realize that your rock and roll heroes idolize the the people that made your town something special, yes. you know, you take a little more pride in it. Yeah, through through your mom and through you know performing and such, were you meeting some of these you know significant artists and you didn't appreciate it at, at the time? Well, I think I not that I didn't appreciate it, but when I was when I was little, you know, her touring band were all people that went on to be you know like successful players. Like Rob Hayek has played fiddle with her on the road back then. Um, Gary Nicholson, who's a you know hit songwriter, right. played guitar in her band. Also, Kevin Welch played guitar in her band. Yeah. Wally Wilson, who went on to run, run Tree after Buddy Killen yeah. uh, retired, played piano in her band. Uh, Jack Sundred, who went on to play in Poco, was her bass player. So the, it was, and then on her yeah. sessions, a lot of times it, you know it was Buddy Spiker on fiddle and Lloyd Green on steel, and uh, and people like that. So there was, um, you know, I always looked up to those people, you know. Um, uh, and then, and then later on, I, I think I could kind of appreciate, you know, who they were independently of just being like people that were nice to me when I was a kid, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. When when did you know? Because you're a you're kind of heralded as a multi instrumentalist yeah. because you know you play great, you know, steel, both non pedal and pedal. You play, you know, fiddle and guitar. You front your own band, the Stone Fox Five. I fiddle play, a little. Don't you, call me for fiddle unless we're in D or A or G. Or, and you, you play bass, both upright and yeah, electric, uh -huh. with the fabulous superlatives. And you play guitar. And and so when when did you start getting into playing these different? What influenced you to start picking up well, other instruments? You know, guitar was I. Anything I play, I feel is just one step removed from guitar. You know, I started with guitar, and then I started playing up the first band I was in. I played electric bass. And, and then it didn't seem that far of a jump to play upright bass. You know, I, I started playing upright when I was, I guess, 15. My friend Matt had rented an upright bass, and I kind of had figured out the, how to do the slap thing a little bit. Um, I wish instead of learning how to play slap, I'd spend a little more time learning just how to play in upper positions with my left hand at the time. But, you know, that was just one step removed from guitar and electric bass to me. Um, mandolin, you know, was something I kind of had a... A, a half-assed interest in 
you know, as like a 12 year old, you know, I just thought it was, you know, just kind of like a fun, different thing that you played in the same way as a guitar. It's fretted and you use a flat pick. And then it made taking up fiddle a little more accessible because I understood the tuning. Right. So that was one less hurdle to get past because there's so many hurdles with fiddle. If you take it up later in life, like I, I was in my mid 20s when I started trying to play fiddle and I'm still, I mean, it took so much work just to be a bad fiddler. You know, I mean, people have to respect bad fiddlers because to get just to the point that you're a fiddler at all, that you're even in the division is, you know, it's tough. A lot of work. But then all I had to deal with was, you know, that and this, uh, the, 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 the tuning part I already, was already had an, an understanding of. Uh, with steel, that kind of happened out of necessity. There was um, this guy who had come to town and he wanted to do like 50s honky tonk stuff and he wanted steel without pedals. And like I was saying a minute ago with upright bass, that in the late 90s there was hardly anyone who played upright bass in that style. You know, there was Roy Husky Jr. and he'd passed away, you know, and then there was, there was Dave Rowe who played slap bass and Dennis Crouch was kind of just, you know, kind of getting in, you know, after Roy passed. But there weren't just, I mean, nowadays lots of people can play that style. So it was kind of a thing of, well, if I wish somebody would do it, I guess I should learn how to do it myself. And it was kind of that way with steel too, with steel without pedals. Um, because nobody, there was kind of an interest in it after BR549 hit because, um, you know, Donnie Heron played, you know, Steel Without Pedals in that band. So a lot of pedal steel players went and bought like a double neck fender, and the, but they didn't really, you know, it's a very different technique. You have to slant the bar and... Uh, it's all about bar technique. It's about, it's a lot about bar technique that's different than what a, a modern pedal steel player will focus on with their technique. And a lot of guys, they would just kind of go, yeah, I bought one of these things. Now what do you want me to do with it? That was kind of the attitude. Like this, I'm above it, but I'll do it, you know, with my eye, rolling my eyes attitude. In interviewing Paul Franklin, mm -hmm. Paul was, was talking about the, the difference between the players that started on non-pedal yeah. and how their bar technique is so much better because they, they don't just move it, you know, parallel. They don't just it's not just a moving capo. Right, yeah. exactly. That they actually, they know how to slam that's where they're it. Yeah. That's where their emotion is, is in their, their bar. Right. And that's something that I still think, I mean, I, you know, I'm, as a steel player first, a non-pedal steel player, but even just trying to be very objective, I tell people, if they say, I want to learn to play steel, I say, spend at least a year playing without pedals. Because every great pedal steel player started as a non-pedal player, mm -hmm. and then when they did go to pedals, the pedals enhanced what they could already do. Right. And if you start with pedals, then that's just a crutch. You know, if you start with pedals, you want to get from your one chord to your four chord, you just mash those pedals down, you know. Right. And as a non-pedal player, you have to know other ways of getting from that move to that move. Um, so that's, I think, a very important thing. If, if somebody wants to take up steel, spend a year playing in a sixth tuning, either C6 or A6 or E6 without pedals. And don't use a volume pedal at first because a lot of players, they, they, they take up steel and they start playing with the volume pedal immediately and they, they end up, without even realizing it, using the volume pedal to mask bad picking and bar technique. Right. And I think a volume pedal is a very important part of playing steel guitar, but you have to learn first how to you know, transition from one, you know, one place to the other without lifting your bar up and getting a buzzy sound out of your strings or without your picks clicking against the strings or without notes ringing out past the point that you want them to because it conflicts with the next chord change. And you see players and they're just, you know, they're, they're working that volume pedal like they're like an old sewing machine with the, you know. Yes. And, and that's not what you want to do. If you watch Paul or if you watch Buddy or if you watch Jerry Bird or any of these, you know, master steel players, you watch that foot and it's barely moving. It moves just a little bit. And it almost is almost like what a little bit of compression does when you add that to, to mm -hmm. a guitar. You know, it just takes a little bit of the attack away and then they can lean in on it for a little emphasis and it makes the guitar more vocal. But it's not this theremin sounding steel guitar thing. And <laughs> you, you can hear that in a lot of steel players that, that didn't right. spend a lot of time working on their, their technique. That yeah, volume they, pedal they, ends up being uh, a crutch. In, instead of an ex, uh, exactly. device for expression, yes, yeah. it ends up, you, know, you pull the volume pedal, you, mm -hmm. know, you, you go to heel just to cover up your bad technique, exactly. and then you go forward all the time, and then yeah. you, you get that awful Milking effect. it is what I call it. You know? Yes, yes. So what was your first uh, profession? You know, so I guess you, you were playing here in town on mm -hmm. Broadway and such, yeah. and some of the, some <clears throat> of the clubs. Yeah, well, uh, like I was saying about getting started with steel, this guy came to town and I played electric guitar 
And there was another guy who was playing electric guitar in his band, and he wanted me in the band, though. So he said, why don't you be the steel player? And I said, I don't have a steel. He said, I've got one. He had a double neck eight string national, and he loaned it to me that night. And the next day I played a four hour gig on it. I'm not gonna say it sounded good, but the next day I played a four hour gig on it is all I'm gonna say about it. Yeah. And it was tuned to C6 with an E on the top. And I think I ended up playing with a flat pick that, for, and I would just, you know, I just found, oh wow, if we're, you know, it's a C tuning. If we're playing in the key of E, you know, I just start on the fourth fret here. That's the E fret. And then, you know, move up five frets for my four chord. And that's the A fret, you know, and I kind of yeah. just would just play across the, 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 the thing about a sixth tuning like that is you can get a very pleasing sound out of it easily. You know, you just strum across it and it's almost like how if you just breathe into a harmonica, it's, it's, it's melodic, you know, yeah. there's, there's a chord in there. Yeah, as long as you're in the right key. As yes. long as you're in the yeah. right key with it, yeah. you know, it's it's not an ugly sound. It's not like a fiddle or something where, you know. It's so hard to even just get Just a to tone. get a note out of it, yeah. yeah. And then you realize a lot of that Hank Williams stuff is Don Helms and Jerry Bird kind of just playing across the fret, you know, do, 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 do. It's just basically a, a pentatonic or just yeah. a, a, you know, major arpeggio with a sixth in there. And that's, that's what the tuning is. So you just play up and down the tuning. It sounds kind of nice. So it's, it's easy to get started and then you kind of get hooked on it. So. Yeah. And how did, so is it through these kind of like, forced things where all of a sudden someone says, okay, you're, you're a steel player. Yeah. Is this where you started getting into older music? Because you also have very much a historian aspect yeah, of, of your persona. Yeah, that was the only subject in, in school I ever cared about was history. I always liked history. And I think um, maybe spending a lot of time, like I was saying, you know, overseas in the summers, you know, made me kind of homesick in a way. And then loving music and history, maybe I think all that came together to where I, I really developed a love for the, the musical history of this place. And where were you digging up this information? Because this is before the internet. Yeah, I, I guess a lot of it was like going to The Great Escape and just looking up, you know, like looking for like rockabilly compilations that had been put out like in the 70s and 80s of obscure artists. Right. And then just kind of putting pieces together there and then realizing like, oh wow, Bebop Alula was cut in town. Like that was cut at the Quonset hut. Yeah. You know, and, and, and just that kind of stuff, like realizing how much of it happened here. Right. You know, and like, of course, like Eddie Cochran was out in LA and there was all the Memphis stuff and Buddy Holly, but, but here in Nashville and Buddy Holly here in Nashville too, you know? Yeah. Not that he particularly liked the work that was done here. I mean, he was kind of going for his own separate thing from that, but but a lot of that stuff happened here. So I think that that was a lot of it. And I think playing on Lower Broadway, we were, you know, I had a rockabilly band, but I think too, just the, you know, if you would watch the band after us or the band before us, it was a lot of, at that time, traditional country. You know, there was a lot of Ray Price and Webb Pierce and Carl Smith. And, and I'd grown up hearing that stuff because that's the stuff that my mother grew up listening to. Her parents had a jukebox in their house and it was, you know, Carl Smith records and Webb Pierce and Johnny and Jack and Hank Williams and Lefty yeah. Frizzell and that kind of stuff. So, uh, so it always seemed familiar to me. A jukebox that, in their home. They had a jukebox in the home, yeah, in the living room. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So what was your first you know, kind of professional gig? I, I guess... Define professional. Yeah, let's... let's so was BR549 the first, like, oh, signed like, band that you were well, with? Well, yeah, the, I... I I went out and played upright bass with Rosie Flores. Anyways, I was supposed to play upright bass. The bass fell apart on the first gig. Um, we were in Memphis and the bridge snapped in half. Mm -hmm. We were out for three weeks. So the next day we, we drove to Texas and then we went to uh, this music store on Lamar. Um, I think it was called Music Makers. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was down the street, closer to the closer to Town Lake than uh, Ray Hiddings was. It was down at the bottom of the right. hill there. Right, yeah, I remember that. Music makers, shop. and yeah. I bought a Dan Electro bass and played electric the rest of the, the run. But I turned 18 on that trip. So yeah. I was 17, and that was my first time touring with somebody where it like, wasn't a family thing, and it wasn't me just like playing a little fun band kind of thing. It was yeah. my first kind of road gig. And then I, I joined BR. I got a call from Dave Rowe. Um, I was, I guess I was... 18. This would have been kind of late 2001. And he said that they had just called him that Jay McDowell had announced that he wanted to leave the band at the end of the year. 
and they'd asked Dave about doing it, and he, you know, of course, was busy with session work in town, and he had recommended me. So I did a couple little just feeling it out things down at the Bluegrass Inn with Chuck and Shaw and Donnie, just the four of us with me playing bass, and then Gary announced that he was also leaving. So then they said, well, why don't you, you're really a guitar player anyways and a singer, why don't you play guitar and we'll get a bass player? So that's kind of how that worked out. And then I joined BR549 as a guitar player and singer. And that was kind of the, the yeah, the Mark II version of the of The kind the of Mark II version of the band, yeah. yeah. Which was tough for me because, you know, I, I was such a fan of the first version, or the, the first, you know, known version of that band, you know, the... Arista Records version with with Gary and Jay, you know, to they, me, that they was, were, I was a fan of that band, and you know, they were very records. very beloved by yeah. know, by everyone in the industry, even even the guys that were pushing the you know the current mm -hmm. you know you know contemporary country music of the day, yeah. you know they would they would go out and see them and had a great appreciation yeah. for them. Yeah, that was that was a tough thing to kind of walk into it being like nineteen years old, you know, to yeah. kind of jump into a thing like that. So to a band where the the uh, an established an you know, established original band, member had, yeah, yeah, yeah. So and, and what what was the next step after that? After that, um, my girlfriend that I was dating at the time wanted to go to grad school at UT Austin and she'd convinced me that that would work out for both of us because Austin's also a music town. So I moved there with her for a year but I didn't really pursue working there. There wasn't really a lot for me to do there. Unless anything I would have done in Austin would have just been like playing in honky tonks and dance halls and beer joints and I could do that here in Nashville. It didn't feel like there was really anything unique no, for and, me and there. there's, there's not the the, the and there's the no session. industry. There's no yeah. session. Yeah. You there's know. no touring industry there. So yeah. you know, yes, Austin is a place where you can play in the clubs, but that's it's really a lot it. of fun. Yeah. I went down there last week and I played with Hay Bale and Tom Lewis. I stayed at Tom's house and wow. played with Hay Bale yeah. and played the night before at the White Horse with with him with Jim Miori and with Melissa Carper and had a ball. I love that town. It's a lot of fun, but just for like from a career standpoint, it just it just didn't feel right to me. You know, at least yeah. you know it didn't feel right at that time for what I wanted to do. Um, and I was also kind of more pursuing being an artist at the time, and there was just no industry there. It just didn't make any sense for me as far as like making records yeah. and things like that goes. When did you start uh, pushing yourself as a front man? When did you start well, realizing? I always, you know, my first band, yeah. my rockabilly band that I played on Broadway with, I was the lead singer and you know lead guitar player. It was a trio, and it was. You know, I was always kind of the front person, and I don't know if that was just out of not, I just didn't really consider not being, you know? Yeah. Um, and I like fronting all right, but I, I do also like, I like every space on stage you can fill. I like, you know, if I get a call to be the drummer and I'm just in the background just, you know, keeping time, or if I'm the lead guitar player and it's my job to kind of lean in and kind of egg the singer on and, and steal the spotlight for a moment and then pass it back to them. I remember yeah. being at a Marty Stewart show taping once, um, before I was in the band, I was just there as like a guest steel player, and I can't remember what song it was, but Marty's singing, and then it's the guitar solo, and Kenny just like steps right in front of him, and just steals it, steals it from him, and burns it down. And then his body language, as he finished the solo, he kind of pointed his neck towards Marty and just kind of like fell back. And it was just like so pro the way that, like the way that Kenny just took it and then just gave it right back. You know, th that space, like that Keith Richards kind of yeah. space where. You know, you kind of you're you're right at the edge of the front of the stage, but you're I don't know. It's just a, it's an interesting and, space to play in. Well, it's in it's, between the band and the front man. You yeah, know? and it's that that area where you know uh, someone that's a true player and also understands entertainment and, and showmanship, mm -hmm. you know, come together. And yeah. it's like it doesn't come together all the time, like with Kenny and. I mean, there's and, a there's a, yeah. a time and a place for it, but you know, there's there's just there's times when it's not right as a musician to be sitting in a chair with a ball cap on reading a chart on stage. There's a time and a place where that's fine, you know, with like this expressionless, you know, what, what Kenny refers to as like being a grim professional. There's, you know, staring at the chart, you know, on stage. There, there's a time and a place for that, you know, I mean, that's basically what symphony players do, you know, we don't yeah. want to see, you know, this, you know. Yeah. But um, <laughs> You don't want to see a guy grim. No, no, yeah. he, nobody wants to see that. But, um, but there's a, you know, there, there's, there's a time and a place where you need to, you know, put a little sex appeal in the show. So, you know, yeah. I don't know if I do that, but, you know, just add a, a little excitement. Yeah. Make it fun. Because it should be fun. You know, it's like the Cowboy Jack thing. We're in the fun business. If you're not having fun, you're not doing your job. So at least make them have fun, you know. Yeah.
So you, you, you try Austin, it doesn't work out, so you move back. Yeah, I, I was there for about a year, and then me and that girl broke up, and I moved back to Nashville. And I guess at that point, I, I kind of thought, you know, I'd been touring a lot under my own name, but, but you know, it's, just, it's, it's hard doing that when you don't have a label and you don't have you know, a lot going. And so I kind of went back to playing on Broadway. I thought, you know what, I could just, instead of driving four hours a day to play for an hour a night, I could just play four hours a day in town and then go home yeah. every day. So I ended up kind of playing more in town, and then that sort of evolved into me working more like sessions and things like that. Um, what were some of your first sessions? I used to work a lot with Mark Nevers. Okay. When he he you know he's not in town anymore, but he um, he used to be like an assistant engineer on like a lot of pop country stuff like in the '90s, and then got fed up and like walked off the job one day and just started recording like you know whatever he wanted to. So he. Did a lot of like the the cool like indie rock stuff that would happen in Nashville, like uh, Silver Jews and Lamb Chop and Bonnie Prince Billy, and there was a lot of cross pollination between that world and like, you know, you might do like a Bobby Bear Jr. record one day where it turned out that like Ray Price or somebody would be involved with it. You know, I remember doing a, a thing once. Uh, there was like a Shel Silverstein tribute record where like it was like you know a bunch of people like that contributing songs like from uh, just all over the map. You know, uh, he kind of had a like a foot in with a few different worlds. So that was kind of a, a a place I used to work a lot, and that kind of gave me freedom. I think working there, as a steel player who plays without pedals, I had a lot of freedom to sort of find my own way to use the steel guitar on sessions that was sort of outside of what a lot of people do, um, because you know a lot of people put pedal steel on like rock records and things, but the pedal steel is tuned and set up in a way where it's very much the same from one instrument to the next. You know, players might have their knee levers in different positions or whatever, but fundamentally the changes are all the same, and and that and it kind of gives it a similar sound, no matter you know kind of what style of music it's in. If they're playing E9 pedal steel, if it's country, if it's rock and roll, you're going to hear the same movements. Right. And playing without pedals, and and trying to find my own space for that, I felt I had a lot of freedom there to sort of find my own way for that instrument to sort of fit in. Um, the other thing with steel without pedals is very quickly, like the first day I had a steel guitar, I, I found myself, you know, it was a C6 tuning with E as the top note, which is the third, and I found myself wanting to take my ring finger and pull that string behind the bar a half step to kind of almost like when you're playing a D, it, like if you play Buckaroo and you get the do da 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 that sound, I started doing that right away on the steel, and then I, uh, I, I became acquainted with Caton Roberts, and that was kind of like this light bulb moment for me because he pulled behind the bar all the time, pulling the yeah. strings. And he played for Hank Snow for you know 30 years, and he never played pedals. He had the same steel he bought brand new in '51, which is an old double neck Fender, the same model as what I have. Um, but when it came time to where he needed to sound like he had pedals, he just started pulling strings behind the bar and developed this whole style around doing that on C6 tuning. Um, so that kind of gave me, and he played really intense too. He had this really like in your face aggression to his playing and he wasn't trying to like, it was just his personality. Yeah, just intensity. Yeah. yeah. Um, he kind of played in the Jerry Bird style, but Bird was a very smooth and relaxed player and Caton just had this like bluesy kind of edge to his approach. And I, and I saw a lot of potential for that to work in a lot of settings outside of just traditional country music or Western swing or you know Hawaiian music or the, the places where you would typically hear a steel without pedals. Right. So yeah, the, the whole bending behind the bar, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a, a wonderful you know, technique that really opens up a lot of... It does. Know. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, you know, and it takes work to do it in tune. You know, and uh, but same as with just even keeping the bar straight across the fret, or when you slant, you know. But if you notice pedal steel players, like if you watch on TV, they'll, they'll do a close up of the steel, and it's just you see they're just kind of doing this the whole time, like their hand just stays in that one spot. But if you watch, you know, somebody playing without pedals, you know, there there's a lot of movement around because you have to keep the because every right. every change is coming from the bar. Yeah. You know, as opposed to. The, on yeah. pedal steel, you know, it's all happening kind of underneath the guitar. You know, yeah. without pedals, it's all happening on top of the guitar. So you're back in town. You're playing sessions. You're playing uh -huh. on Broadway. What happens next? Um, I one thing that I had done, I'd made a record out in Tucson at a place called Wave Lab, 
at a studio where like uh, Nico Case had made a bunch of records and Calexico makes all their records out there. And I really like the sound of that studio. I like the drum sound on this one Calexico song. Okay. And I thought, I'm gonna make a record there. And this was actually when I was living in Austin. I thought it's 13 hours to drive to Tucson, 13 hours to go home to Nashville. I'll just make a record in Tucson. So I go out there because I love the drum sound on this one song. And, and, I'm, and that's the whole reason I'm there. And I asked the engineer, tell me about the drum sound on that song, what it is. And he laughs and says that they had, it was sort of like a run through of the song that they ended up using as the take. And they had hardly, you know, like wired, you know, the, the mics yet. So the drum sound is just the drums bleeding onto the upright bass mic. <laughs> and, I, you know, I love old records, you know, and, right. and, and I, there's been so many times in my life when I've been like, do you really have to put two mics on the snare drum? Like, what? The, the, you know, new records, the drums, well, they, they don't sound like one instrument. It just sounds like all these individual drums that are like in your face and louder than the vocal and, you know, all this. I love old records and how the drums sound so live and, and yeah. you know, airy. And then it's like, well, there you go. Like, I you yeah. know, made a record because I like the drum sound when the, there weren't even yeah. any damn mics on the drums. Yeah, because it was, it was retro on accident. Because I, that, yeah, I guess you could call it that. Or it's just treating the drums like one instrument. You know, I mean, right. Keith Richards said in his book, he joked about how nowadays they put 17 mics on the drums and you spend a week getting a drum sound and the drums still sound like crap. Whereas in 1962, you'd put one mic on the drums, spend no time getting a sound in it, and the drums always sounded great. So I don't know. Yeah, yeah, there, and there's there, when you start having multiple mics on the same thing, you start dealing with phase cancellation. There's so much, also, yeah, and it's so much purer when you use less microphones. But yeah. yeah, you end up focusing on the technology more than you focus on the record, if that yeah. makes any sense. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. There's different ways to define what the record is, and I guess for engineers nowadays, it's probably more about that stuff. But maybe I don't know. It just makes things kind of flatline for me in my heart, anyways, yeah. when I listen to music. So, is it in this time? Are you starting to play with like? Because I know that you played some with Michael Nesmith, and you played with Susie Boggess. Yeah. And you played well, some that's with, where yeah. I was getting with the recording at Wave Lab. I um, M Ward did a couple days worth of sessions there before I got to town early. And I ended up playing steel on some sides for him. And then a couple of years later, he asked if I'd go on the road with him playing guitar and steel, which I did. And then the next year, yeah, I, I went out with, with him and Zoe Dejanel playing in the, the band for She and Him. And that was kind of the start of me, I think, just thinking like, you know what? I kind of like being a side guy and not having to worry about, you know, the, so much of the artist stuff and, right. and trying to, it's just... It's like, and people always want me to do that. People want to pay me to show up and play guitar with them or music with them. I, you know, so I, I, I kind of started to like the idea of, of doing that more. And just so much of what I focus on when I listen to records was not really me focusing like on if I listen to, you know, a Ray Price record. You know, I love listening to Ray sing, but I, f I always find myself being more drawn to like, you know, what's Jimmy Day playing or what's Tommy Jackson playing or what's Grady or, or Pete playing on guitar. That always ended up being more the, the stuff that I wanted to zone in on was that, that second and third layer of the sound and not just the, the top layer. Um, so yeah, that, that's always just, you know, been what's, what intrigues me or like those, you know, the, 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 the layers underneath the, the most obvious part of it. So that's what sticks out to me anyways. It was always what the pickers were doing. You know? Yeah. And so you, you get back to Nashville. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, so I, I played with, you know, M. Ward and then she and him. And then right about that time, too, was when I got the Michael Nesmith gig uh, and did that for a couple of years. And then I played with Susie Boggess for uh, a couple of years. And then in that time, also, I was playing a lot like with Robbie Fulks and, and, and different just here and there things, juggling a lot. I remember once being on a Robbie Fulks gig and I had a chart book and I was uh, on the left side of my chart book was charts for one person, and then on the right side was his, and then he started making fun of that on stage. Like, it was, I think it was Michael Nesmith charts on the left hand side of the, the book, and his charts on the right. And, you know, and he was like, oh, like some of Shelley's blues, you know, or, you know, like, you know, different drum, like, he, you know, sort yes. of saying things about. And I thought, man, it'd be so great if I just, you know, didn't have to, like, be juggling, like, learning and retaining, because I have trouble, like, sleeping sometimes if I get music stuck in my head. And when you have to learn music, 
It's hard. The songs get stuck in your head, and then before you know, it's like six a.m. and you haven't I mean, slept. Yeah, you, you kind of have to live those to to really perform those songs well and to yeah. really do the show. It feels like you have to, you know, you really have to get invest. inside it. Yeah, and sometimes you don't have a lot of time to do that, and then you just have to cram, and it dominates your life. And then you're and, reading charts. Yeah, yeah. And then you know, my my wife and I had a, a baby on the way, and I was thinking, man, it'd be so much easier if like I just had one gig where I just had like that to know and that to learn and just didn't have to juggle a lot of stuff. Yeah. And that's about the time um, I was doing a gig with my band, Chris Gruggs and the Stone Fox Five, and Kenny asked me, hey man, if you know of any, any bass players in town, Paul Martin's leaving the superlatives, if, if you think of anyone who might want to do it, and I said, I'll do it, I'd like to do it. He said, you wouldn't mind being stuck on bass? I was like, no, I, I like playing bass. You know, I, I don't care what instrument I'm playing as long as it's music that I like. I'll be the tambourine player in the band. Yeah. If it's music that I like versus be the guitar player and take all the solos in a band that I don't like or, you know. And I liked everything that I was doing at that time, but I was just, I was juggling a lot. Right. So um, Marty called me out to his office and we just kind of talked about music and records and stuff and kind of what he was looking for and what I was looking to get into. And he had one of Paul's suits out there and said, just try this on. Because, you know, there's so many suits. And they're very expensive. And they're, they're yeah. expensive, but beyond that, like, it takes a while just to get them. You know, like, you commission yeah. them and then it takes a while. It was just like, could you just fall into this and we just pick it up without losing a beat? So, and I tried the suit on and it fit pretty well. So I, I joke when people say, how'd you get the Marty gig? I say, well, I asked... Marty, what kind of you know what kind of a bass player are you looking for? And he said, you know, a forty-two regular, or, you know. Yeah, that's, it's kind of like a. I, I'm trying to think of yeah, you because know, there were so many bands that, of course, wore yeah, yeah, you know, matching. That, that's outfits. a true story. I mean, that, yes. that I think it was Stonewall Jackson where somebody right. they they meant, are you looking for an upright or electric bass? Like, what kind of bass player are you looking for? And he said, I'm looking for a thirty-eight long. You yeah, know? and they and were that's serious. What his uni band yeah. uniforms were yeah, <laughs> because he they, they he owned the uniform. And I think and... Mel Tillis sometimes would like try to find like someone if somebody left the band, yeah. somebody who could fit in the uniform, you know, but. Um, so that's kind of what I what I joke. So I, I I started playing in Marty's band. I signed on at the very end of fourteen and started going on the road with with him in early fifteen. Wow, I didn't realize it'd been that. It'd been, yeah, it's you know, been a so, while almost now. Eight it's years. Eight yeah, years. Yeah. yeah. What was Marty wanting from a bass player? Just you know, someone who just loves country music and can play you know upright and electric and you know, there's no drama in that band. You know yeah. because. You know, why? Why would you want to, you know, it's it's nice to just be in a situation where you get on the bus and everyone just, you know, laughs and talks about country music and that's kind of the only thing that's going on, you know. Because yeah. um, it's too complicated otherwise. So I think it was more just like making sure personality was yeah. good and all that. And, and I mean, we all love the same music and we all love the same stuff and we've all kind of devoted our lives to, you know, fighting for country music first. And um, I think it was just a making sure that we kind of saw things eye to eye, sort of a thing. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think people don't people under underestimate the uh, the value of being uh, of having good you know sandbox politics or just being good to get yeah. along with. Yeah. And how that there's you spend so much time together out on the road, mm -hmm. and then of course just the ability to to play together and such, and then and that's such a. Uh, Marty, you know, and the band, y'all you know, put on such an amazing show. Well, thanks. With it's a, a fun band to yeah. be in. I mean, it's musically just, you know. And I mean, that's the other reason why I wanted to. I mean, that's you know, from a musical standpoint, why I wanted to join was just, it's just a great band. Well, and it doesn't, and it's not as as a player, you're you're being challenged by the the different styles that you, because you're gonna, you know, Marty's gonna pick up the mandolin and he's gonna yeah. do some some bluegrass tunes and you're gonna play upright if you have one and you're it's gonna It's like play. a package show with only four people on stage. I mean, yeah. I, for, as somebody who's seen the show before I was in it, it, it it's like watching, you know, those old country music package shows in the, the 60s where there'd be, you know, like, you know, four different artists and then different backup musicians for each one of them where it starts as this like loud in your face Telecaster show. Yeah. And then about, you know, eight songs in, he picks up an acoustic and I go to the upright and there's maybe a couple boom chicka boom things with like a Johnny Cash kind of beat. And then maybe, it, and then Kenny sings a couple songs and then Marty gets a mandolin and Harry just gets the snare with brushes and we Ooh. sing her on one mic. And then I do a couple songs, Harry does a couple songs. We do maybe a, a gospel song or Marty does Orange Blossom special and then that's yeah, it. You, you know, might do one of the you know Souls Chapel. You know, the yeah, kind of the, yeah. uh, you know the. Uh, that was the singers. that was the toughest part for me. You know, the, the bass part is easy, but man, the vocal, you know, standard in that band is just so high. I mean, you know, coming in after Paul, Paul's such a great singer. Paul right. Martin and Harry's such a great singer. You know, and yes. and 
and and you know what they have, and I'm, of course Marty's a great singer, you know, uh, but just you know having some of those parts, you know, sometimes Marty's parts will will jump between the low part and the middle part, and then I've got to kind of weave around that, and you know it's and then we're singing around one mic, you know, I mean it's it's a lot of uh, you know that's that's the thing that I still sweat bullets on in that band is you know just the the vocal aspect. There's a couple tunes in particular where I'm like. Oh, we're doing that one, and oh my gosh, okay, all right, just you know, hold your breath and <laughs> better put on your big boy pants. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, and then you're, uh, you know, Kenny has joked about being, you know, have like 300 songs that you know, or something like that. But I mean, you know, just so does he always set forth a, a set list, or is there two? Yeah, there's always a calls? set list. Yeah. Um, there's definitely like pillars in the set list, like things that kind of don't move. Or if they do, it's not very often that they're not in the set list, and then kind of filling in the gaps, you know, within those kind of key moments. And there's yeah. certain, there's always, you know, at certain parts in the show, there's like certain types of songs, and there might be maybe five or six songs that could fill a certain role. Right. And then sometimes Marty might get on a kick with some random song, like um, after Paul English died, we were doing a meet and greet in Texas, and Paul English had just passed away, and just on a whim, he just started singing Me and Paul, yeah. Willie Nelson, you know. And then that became like that stuck in the show for like two and a half years, you know, and it turned into this like seven minute long, you know, guitar jam at the end of it thing. And it kind of just evolved from there and kind of took on its own life and became a, a thing, you know. Yeah. So that happens sometimes. And those will kind of yeah. sneak up on you, you know. Um, and that, that's kind of the, the fun part of it is just kind of seeing how, how things just kind of evolve and change over time. What's the stage volume like? Um, I've heard some people refer to some of the amplifiers on stage as flamethrowers. So that's, I mean, the, the biggest amp on stage is a deluxe. So that, you know, as yeah. loud as a deluxe can be. But, um, I mean, it can get pretty loud. Okay. It can get pretty loud. Uh, but then we play completely acoustically, too. I mean, completely as in with no amps. You know, we're in the yeah. house. Uh, so there, it's a wide, wide range. And we do acoustic shows, too. I mean, if the room is... A certain size or smaller, or if it's a certain liveliness to the room, we just don't even try to play electric. You know, yeah. there's bands that will play electric in rooms where we just go, "Nah, that's not going to work." You know, yeah, We're I think too that the room. with with Marty with that Clarence White guitar, it's got it's got to kind of hit the amp with at a certain level for it to really do for it its to sound thing. Right. For, for it to, to do its alive. thing. Yeah. That bridge pickup was wound by Red Rhodes, yeah. and it's uh, and it's really hot. It's hot like a steel guitar, like a pedal steel pickup. And it, and it kind of, you know, it's not like any other Telecaster. It, and it's got to hit the amp at a certain, you know, at a, a level for it to really sing and do its thing. So if we can't do that, we just do an acoustic show. Yeah. Do you all use wedges or in-ears? We use wedges. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's interesting, you know, m mentioning, uh, you know, of course, of course, many people are, of course, fans also of that guitar. Yeah. And you have a lot of people that want to come out and see the guitar and such. And Funny story, last summer we were in Europe for three weeks. And we had the first week was in the UK and the next two weeks were on the continent. And we have a couple songs, you know, that, that where Kenny plays a 12-string Rick. And uh, we were, it was our first show on the continent. We were a week into this three-week tour. And we walked out on stage for the encore in, in Kenny's boot got underneath the cable of his 12 string and he took a step and it pulled off the stand and his face planted at Paradiso in Amsterdam. Cracked the headstock. Not a horrible crack, like it didn't bust it off, but it was enough where- It wasn't stable. We shouldn't, it, it was not stable. So um, I got on Instagram and Facebook and made a post, hey, we're looking for 12 string Rickenbackers to get through the rest of this run in Europe. And we were able to get three people to provide 12 string Ricks for us. One in Denmark, and it worked out perfectly. We, all our Scandinavian shows kind of, we, we stayed in Copenhagen with a day off and then played Scandinavian shows and then had a, a, a gig close to Copenhagen and the guy picked his guitar back up. Then we went to Berlin and a guy had one there. And then we went to Switzerland for two days and a guy brought one there. And the only thing any of those people wanted was just, can I get my picture taken with Clarence White's Telecaster? Yeah. And we said, yes, yes. you may. Yes, you, yes may. you may get your picture made with Clarence White's guitar. And they were all more than happy, you know, to, yeah. to show up. I mean, the guy in Denmark basically gave us his Rick he'd had for 50 years and said, I'll see you next week, you know. Yeah. And all he wanted was his picture with Clarence's guitar. So that guitar has its own. I mean, that's, 
Marty refers to it as a, it's a band member. You know, that guitar is a band member. Yeah. So. Being, you know, you of course have a Telecaster here with you. How would you, how would you define that guitar? What's, what's special about that guitar? It's special, you know, it's the guitar that Clarence White played in the Birds. And, you know, the Birds had just recorded Sweetheart of the Rodeo with Lloyd Green on steel, and then also J.D. Manis on some of it as well. Right. And um, Roger was considering getting a steel player for the band. And Clarence had this idea of having a Telecaster, or, you know, and he had kind of just switched over to electric from, you know, you know he reinvented how to play bluegrass right. acoustic guitar. And then he sort of reinvented, you know, or created this new role for electric guitar in country where it was kind of this hybrid between guitar and steel where the, the, the strap pin, and I'm, you know, I'm not, I know you know this, but for, for people who might not be well versed watching, when you push the neck of the guitar down, it you know pulls the strap pin, which is on a hinge that goes to a mechanism that pulls the B string up a full step to C sharp, which emulates the sound of an A pedal on a pedal steel guitar. So it created this hybrid Telecaster pedal steel sound in one instrument. Right. And um, you know most people when they think of the Birds, they think about the early era with David Crosby and and uh, uh, Michael and Gene Clark and you know the the more the, the Rickenbacker era of the band where it was more about the 12 string and right. the, the folky stuff but there was the later era of the band which was largely defined by Clarence White's you know exploring this new space with this instrument uh, this B bender Telecaster and then he was killed by a, a, a in a he was loading in his amplifier into a club and got hit by a car and that sort of put it into that you know there was a few people who kept that that sound and style going but Marty acquired his actual guitar from his widow about 10 years after he had passed away. And, and you know, he's such a Clarence White super fan, you know. I mean, you look at pictures of Marty in the early 80s with that guitar and you think, man, he almost looks like Clarence. You know, he grew a beard out for him. Right. Like, he really immersed himself yeah. in the same way that Pete Wade immersed himself into Grady Martin style and in the same way that, you know, I, for a while I did that with Kate and Robert Steele playing. Yeah. You know, he really just, you know, put himself into it. I mean, when you hear Marty play, it's the closest you're going to get to hearing Clarence White. And, and that's one of the interesting things when you when you learn about players and singers, you yeah. learn that there's this this step of of becoming themselves. Uh -huh. But before that, they imitate others. It's like Keith Richards yes. with Chuck Berry, or and then Chuck Berry with T Bone Walker, yeah. and then T Bone or, Walker with Charlie Christian. Yeah, or or, or Merle Haggard with Win Stewart or Lefty and Frizzell. Lefty Frizzell. Yeah, and, and Lefty and, with Jimmy Rogers. Yes, and then, and, yeah. or George Jones with uh -huh. you know, and you or Ray Charles, you know, Im imitating a Nat King Cole or mm -hmm. something like that. It's like, and and it seems like either they come to the point on their own, or they finally just decide, or they have someone that puts the pressure on them, saying, "Hey, there's already so and so. You need. Well, yeah. you know, what's your what's your sound? What's well, like your Speedy voice? West was was really caught up with Joaquin Murphy's steel playing, right? And and he did a couple sessions where he was just trying to play like Joaquin. And the producer said, "Man, anytime Joaquin make it can't make it, we'll call you." And he realized, yeah. "Oh, I got to come up with my own thing." Yeah. And that's when he started like doing the crashing yeah. the bar down and the wah 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 stuff. Was yeah. to kind of set himself apart because he he just needed something to be different. Right. Or Ernest Tubb, you know, wanted to be Jimmy Rogers, and then he, had, you know, and he had his he tonsils had, taken out and he couldn't yodel anymore. That's right. And all of a sudden he had the low voice. And he had a lower range all of it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's um, somebody told me uh, when I was a uh, this kid I went to high. I don't even remember the guy's name. When I was in high school, you know, the teenagers know everything. But this was actually good advice. This this one guy said, "Your style is dictated by your limitations." And I thought, like that's yeah. that's really something, you know, um, and it's true. It is, you know, you're because if you can just do everything, then you're you're kind of not doing anything, um, you know. And that and that's our kind of our goal. I mean, I hear Andy Reese, who's a you know a hero and, and a friend of mine, say this a lot: is that it, what we all hope for as musicians is to get to the point where somebody doesn't call you just because they want a guitar player. They call you because they want you. Right. They want the, the thing that you do. You know. They want your contribution, yeah. which is different. And, and maybe there's things that you don't get called for because you're not the right person for that thing. But when you do get called, it's because they want you to do that thing that you do. And you that's know? the best thing. That's what we're all, that's what yeah. we're all going for. Because you're not being called to play like Grady Martin. Yeah. Yeah. Although sometimes it's fun to try. Yes. You know? So I, I guess what I was asking about the Clarence White guitar is if you take away the, uh, the you know, kind of nostalgia of it, What's interesting about that guitar? 
Well, I mean, it's the prototype B right. bender instrument. I, I don't know if that if that still factors into the nostalgia. Right. If the nostalgia and just his historical yeah. significance are separate things. I guess, what, I guess what is it like just as a guitar? It's a nice guitar. It's got a yeah. it's got a soft V neck. Um, so it's like a mid fifties, you know, sunburst over ash, Telecaster. Um, it's heavy yeah. because. Nowadays, with a B-Bender, they'll route out the back of it and put the mechanism inside of the guitar. And on this one, they just added it behind the guitar and then it has put this shell. extra like, casing around that. So the guitar is about like that thick. Yeah. And it weighs about as much as a banjo. It's like maybe 11 pounds or so. Yeah. Um, it's pretty heavy. You know, the, the, um, but yeah, it's just it's a special. The neck pickup is from a 54 Stratocaster. The bridge pickup was rewound by Red, Red Roads to be really, really hot. And it's the pull of the B-Bender is different than any other. Most B-Benders, they just snap up to that next note. It's this really quick pull. Right. And on that one, you can milk and go. You know, you can, there's a lot of travel there. Right. So you have a lot of control over that. And you can really, you know, work in that space between B and C sharp. Yes. Uh, and that's the thing Marty complains about on any other B-Bender is, that eh, it pulls too fast. And, right. And he told... Um, he told uh, Gene Parsons years ago. He said, "You know, the, the new guitars they pull too fast. Check this one out. This is, you know, the first one that Gene had done mm -hmm. that Gene and Clarence did together." And Gene was like, "Wow, I don't remember this being so such a long pull." So now Gene Parsons offers a, a, a short a pull and a long pull version. Yeah. But even then, the, the Clarence guitar is like it's a little bit longer, but it's a little squeakier and it's a little more, little rustier and a little. It's got a little more dirt and grime and history on it but that's part of what makes it special you know that's yeah. that's what makes it it's, kind of this living thing you it's know? the it's the first one it is so and then more more recently there was the uh roger mcguinn and chris hillman joined you you guys yeah. used it as your backup as the backup mm -hmm. band and they not as the birds yeah but just as a sweetheart of the rodeo what was it 50th 50th anniversary, anniversary. yeah, yeah. I, I think some of that was it was right after there were some California wildfires, and, and, and I think Hillman's house had some damage to it. And, and I think some of it was him and Roger were talking, and, and Roger thought, well, you know, we should, we should go out and do something. We should get out of town a bit. And yeah. of course, they don't live, you know, Roger lives in Clearwater, Florida, and, and uh, uh, Hillman lives in Ventura. Yeah. But they said, we, should, we, should get, we should get out and do something, you know? So they, they kind of put together this idea and approached Marty about it, and, and Marty, you know, liked the idea. So we went out and we did. We did two sets a night. We did one set sort of talking about how the birds led up to having an interest in doing, you know, like a country rock and roll album. Um, you know, songs from their earlier, which I, I think some of that was kind of explaining that it wasn't just that Graham Parsons showed up. And then we went, right. okay, let's make a country record. Like, they right. had interest in that beforehand. Yeah. You know, there were, there were songs on earlier birds records that were, were clearly, you know, inspired by... An interest in like you know Buck Owens and right. you know in country music and and it's the uh, the Graham Parsons you know, influence has been overstated. And it's like even though his influence was was, was yeah. great, but it's it he's gotten kind of that, more credit than that, he was. That due. record wouldn't have happened without Graham Parsons. But yeah. at the same time, that record wouldn't have happened with only Graham Parsons. You know, right. I mean, you know, Roger and, and Chris were you know Chris grew up. You know, in in L.A., you know, like watching Town Hall Party and with Joe Mathis and Tex Ritter and the Collins right. kids and, 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 and all of them. Buck and, Owens and playing bluegrass, the, yeah. the squirrel barkers and all, exactly, all, those, yeah. all those those bands. So yeah. uh, the first set, you know, we did a couple birds hits and, and played songs off of their albums that had sort of shown them leaning in that direction. And then the second set started with talking about, you know, the, the story about Chris meeting Graham at the, the bank in, you know, right. Beverly Hills. And then they started talking about, you know, George Jones and whatnot and... It kind of is, and then in that set we would play the album live, and uh, and some of it Marty would play Clarence, you know, on the the B Bender stuff, because Clarence kind of joined the band right after right. they made that record. I mean th that that whole era of the band kind of like happened and exploded really quickly. Right, and Graham left and yeah. all this, other, all this, yeah. Um, and so, but a, a lot of it was was you know that 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 half of the show was Kenny was playing electric bass and I was playing steel. So I had to learn, you know, JD and, and mostly Lloyd's parts. Right. And uh, and we played at the Ryman, and you know, the Ryman is not a room where you want to play loud. It, it's not made for that, you know. I mean, it was made for public speaking without a PA system. And then the Grand Ole Opry, when it was there, was very quiet. And we're on stage and we're playing loud, so I can hear the house louder than I can hear my amp behind me. And I'm playing steel, 
And I'm like, I can't even hear myself. I can just hear, you know, the the reverberations. Yeah. And then I let in three rows in is Lloyd sitting there, and I'm like, oh geez, you know, because <laughs> Lloyd, you know, I'm yeah. copping Lloyd's parts. And, and Marty is such a, a steel guitar drill sergeant. Like I've seen him do it with steel players. And when he said, you'll play steel on this tour, I was like. Oh God! You know, like it's, I know how this goes. Is I'm going to be sitting there at rehearsal, and Marty's going to come over with a chair and sit it right in front of my steel, and sit down and say, "All right, now show me what you're going to play." And I'm going to da 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 da. It's like, uh uh, do it like this, and he'll start playing it to you. You know, I mean, he's basically like what Dale Potter was on the fiddle, where Potter thought he was a steel player. Like Marty, he's he's a steel player, but he right. plays guitar when he does it. Yeah. Um, the, you had to stay after class. I had to stay after class. Yeah. So, uh, out behind the barn, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, but I think I learned a lot about, you know, that style and getting kind of inside of it, you know, because of that. So, I think it made me a better, better pedal pusher than I used to be because I've always focused more on the non pedal stuff, you know. Yeah. You have, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the Stone Fox Five. Yeah. So, that's, that's, you know, a band that, that you front. Uh huh. And, uh, and, and you kind of focus on pre, kind of, I guess pre sixty, maybe even pre fifty four country music, or maybe yeah, you know. I'd say you know, when I started doing that band, my 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 thought was you know, so many people still at that time, and I think it's changed a little since then. They have this kind of like oh, Nashville, oh, more like you know Trashville, you know all that crap they play on the radio, and the, you know, there's this like anti Nashville attitude with traditional country people sometime, and right. and I think and I understand that. I understand the frustrations, you know, I share those frustrations, but I think they use the term Nashville as like a vague word that sort of sums up everything they don't like, even though they don't exactly know what it is they don't like. Like they don't know who the heads of the labels are, or they don't know who the, who runs the radio stations. They just know if they just say Nashville, it just sums up everything that they don't like about new country music. Right. And they sort of blame it on the city, which I don't think is fair, you know, cause I mean, Nashville is still, you know, I mean, you know, it's it's where, you know, it, it all ha all the good stuff happened here too. So I, I think I started that band thinking people should be able to come to Nashville and see a band playing the good side of things that people love about this place and remind them of the positive instead of just leaning into this like kind of self-important negative thing that I think is easy to do and it can kind of feel like kind of build you up a little bit to cut something else Self -righteous. down. Self-righteous. Yeah, so I, I, I started that band thinking people should be able to come to Nashville and hear a band playing this type of country music the same way you can go to New Orleans and hear like Preservation Hall. Yes. Or you can go to, you know, you can go to different cities and hear people playing like the music that made that place a good thing. And not just playing Hank Williams songs with like a loud drummer and somebody with a Telecaster through a twin and like somebody with steel with pedals who doesn't care to learn Don Helms parts. You know, I wanted it to be a band where we really did it like they did back then. So, so you don't have a drummer. Yeah, we don't have drums. We have, you know, I play a flat top rhythm guitar and strum it, open chords. And then uh, Wes Langlois plays arch top rhythm, which is, you know, more of like a, what they used to call sock rhythm or slap right. rhythm. And that fills the space of the snare drum. And then upright bass. And then any acoustic instrument on stage we mic, you know, which I mean, in the old days, they would have worked one mic, but you know, that's we make an. Ex everyone gets their own mic, yeah. and then uh, you know, hollow body arch top electric guitar. Kenny Vaughn plays that, and then um, steel guitar without pedals, and then fiddle. Yeah, it's just you know, so it's a six piece band. You know, it's me and the Stone Fox Five, and the idea is just to, to play that music with that sound because it's such a, a, a nice sound. You know, I love the sound of those rhythm guitars working together, the arch top and the flat top playing those different roles. It's like the, the flat top strumming the chords gives it this jangly sound that almost fills the space of like what a cymbal would do. And then the arch top with the zing cha, zing cha, almost is like the snare, snare. drum. Yeah. And then the bass is kind of like the, the bass drum, you know. And then the electric guitar playing the tic tac style like Sammy Pruitt would play with Hank Williams or dun tick, dun tick, dun tick. That kind of it's emphasizes double. both the on and the off beat. And so it just creates this, you know, this nice sound where it's, everything's kind of subtle. You don't have to worry too much about the like everything just kind of mixes itself. All those almost like with a five piece bluegrass band, all those instruments work very well. They kind of mix themselves, and it's the same kind of thing where they just blend really well together. You know, yeah. so it's just it's a fun way to play those songs. You know, if you're going to play Carl Smith and, and Hank Snow and Red Foley and you know Ernest Tubb and Hank Williams and Lefty and all that stuff, that's just the fun way to do it for me. 
it's not as fun when you have to sort of like force those songs on like a loud band, you know. It, yeah. it takes a lot of the nuance and sensitivity away that you get when you, when you do it with a band like that. So you also have a radio show that's yeah. on, you know, Friday Friday nights after the Opry. That's right. Friends and Neighbors. Friends and Neighbors with Chris Scruggs, sponsored by Carter Vintage. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, I, 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 I love the show and I love the charm of it because it's such a, a, a throwback. It, it, it's, yeah, it's just, it's charming and, well, and friendly and you have that's wonderful we guests go for. on. Well, thank yeah. you. Yeah, that, that used to be a regular part of radio was live radio, you know, 15 minute spots. And in the old days on WSM and... You know, a lot of the radio stations, they'd have, you know, hillbilly singers on to do 15-minute spots. And, um, and that is kind of what we're, we're going for with those, you know. And, and, and a lot of those, too, that, you know, they, they wouldn't have an audience, so the band would just <laughs> clap for themselves after each song, hit an open string, and then, <laughs> yeah, whoa, woo! And then, you know, and then they, they'd joke about it, about, you know, how yeah. there's no one there and stuff like that. And, um, is so, that what y'all do? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And uh, so that was kind of the idea there, was just to harken back like to uh, like the Hank Williams Health and Happiness shows or uh, Roy Acuff, R.C. Cola shows or, you know, those, those types of radio, Flatten Scruggs used to do a Martha White, you know, spot on WSM, uh, that, that sort of era of, you know, hillbilly music. Uh, and so I told Marty about the idea and I'd recorded a, um, a sort of pilot for it. And I played it for him. He said, this needs to be on WSM. So he, you know, uh, called the guy who was the station head at the time and said, "You need to go down there and show this to him." So I did, and they they liked it. Yeah. So that you know ended up on. They said, "Well, we got a you know time after the Friday night Opry. You know, Saturday night's Midnight Jamboree, Ernest Ebb Record Shop, but we could put you on Friday after the Opry." And I was like, "Yeah, that's great." So you know, fifteen minutes after the Opry every Friday, that's a lot of fun. And you've had a lot of cool guests. We have yeah. everyone from you know Sierra Farrell when she first moved to town, you know, and she. I don't know if she like hopped a train here or had a van by then or what, but she was, you know, kind of, you know, just, you know, just starting out, you know, yeah. uh, people like, like her, uh, and uh, to like Ry Cooter was on the show cause he liked it and wanted to be on, uh, Marty's been on it. Yeah. Um, a uh, lot, a lot of, a lot of, a lot, lot of fun guests have been on it. Yeah, you, you played me a clip of, of Sierra singing you know, Making, Making Believe. Believe, and it just it almost brought a tear to my eye. Just the purity oh, and thank the, you. of it. It was just, uh, and the, the playing and every, everything on it was just, just fantastic. Well, and, and again, it's the Stone Fox Five, so that's that sound that we're going for, is that sound of like old Nashville. Like, if I had to take that, that band and kind of lock it into an era, I'd say the sound of country music after World War II, but before Elvis Presley, you know? After World War II, it was kind of more, you know, the honky-tonk thing started to take off, and you had more electric guitar and steel guitar, but it was still, you know, they didn't allow drums on the Grand Ole Opry. It was still, the, the rhythm section was acoustic, uh, string instruments. It was a lot of fiddle, and it was before, you know, in 56 when Elvis hit, you know, that if you talk to the old-timers or talked to them, they're mostly gone now, of that era, to them, that was the moment everything changed. You know, the Elvis Presley just about put us out of work in '56, and and boy, he did. I mean, you know, nobody had any interest in hillbilly music, so they 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 sort of restructured what country music was, and that's when the CMA was formed in '57, and you know, you had Owen and Chet developing the Nashville sound as a way to make country music more pop oriented. Yeah. Because the other thing that happened with Elvis was he killed traditional pop music. All of a sudden people didn't, you know, radio stations didn't want to play Rosemary Clooney and, and Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra. They wanted to play rock and roll. So Nashville s said, well, if we could make pop oriented records, we could sell records to these, you know, the, the parents, the people in their 30s and 40s. The disenfranchised. The disenfranchised because radio yeah. was chasing teenage money all of a sudden right so um so you had that side of country music the, the the slick nashville sounds side which is great too i mean people 
talk about, oh, the Nashville sound, but I'm like, man, listen to Hello Walls and tell me there's anything wrong with that record. Those, those or are... listen to Crazy or I'm Sorry or any of those records. And like, you know, you don't really have a problem with the Nashville sound. Those are great records and everybody loves them. Right. Um, they're masterful, you know. I mean, as good as it got. You yeah, know? the arrangements and the playing, every, every, every part of that. But, but then you had that side of country after 56 and then you also had the people who kind of like, you know, stuck their flag in the ground for traditional country, like you had Ray Price with the shuffle sound, and then on the coast you had Buck Owens with his pledge to country mm -hmm. music, I will never record a song that's not a country song. <laughs> yeah. And then of course he recorded Johnny Be Good, but right he said, well, that. when I sing it, it's a country song, because I don't, right. get, you know, he had yeah. his way around it. But yeah. but there was this sort of politicized statement about tri about country music, and I feel like before 56, it was a little more innocent. It was a little more, country music was kind of this, this niche market that kind of sold records to the people that liked it. And it didn't really concern itself too much with the outside world. And I think after 56 and after the, the Elvis scare of that time, uh, country music became a little more self-aware. Like if you heard Twin Fiddles on a record, it was like this statement, like we're having Twin Fiddles. And before right. that, it was just, oh, it sounds so nice when Tommy and Jackson and Dale Potter play Twin Fiddles together. Let's have Twin Fiddles yeah, on the but, record. Yeah, there is a difference between we're just doing this or we're making a statement. Exa yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, I like that era of, you know, after World War II, and it's, you know, it's, it's still kind of string band music. There's, there's no drums, but you've got electric instruments, you've got Fender amplifiers, you know. It, it's kind of this transitional moment between the old time world of country music of, of Roy Acuff and, and Dave Macon and, you know, uh, you know the, the, that early world of country music, and, and what came later. You know the 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 more electrified contemporary sound. You know like Merle Haggard, Conway Twitty, George Jones. Right. You know that 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 space in between those two worlds, which yeah. I guess is kind of where Hank Hank Williams kind of lives in there. You know. Yeah. So recently, you were. I mean, an, an, I would have to assume that you you were probably one of the youngest people to ever to be inducted into the Musicians Hall of Fame. Jay McDowell said at the ceremony that I am the youngest person to be in, inducted, and it's quite quite an honor. It quite is an honor, you wow. know, along with the su fabulous superlatives to uh, yeah. to be inducted in the Musicians Hall of Fame. Yeah, what? that was a definitely a pinnacle moment for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's that's really something. <laughs> yeah, and and for those that are anyone's coming to Nashville, that's one of the uh, besides the of course the Country Music Hall of Fame, the Musicians Hall of Fame is a really wonderful uh, museum to uh, to hit up. Especially just to see the acknowledgement to a lot of pickers. You know, early on with the the Country Music Hall of Fame now inducts musicians. Right. You know, they've inducted you know a lot of the A team players like Grady Martin and Harold Bradley and and uh, and Pig Robbins and Charlie McCoy and. Um, but a lot of with the, you know, originally the idea was with the Country Music Hall of Fame, they would induct artists, songwriters, and executives. And musicians, it was a thing where they said, we're not going to induct just players. Right. And they, they, they changed their tune on that finally, thank goodness. But the nice thing about the Musicians Hall of Fame is that they, they acknowledge, and not just with country music, but with rock and roll and soul and R&B and, and everything, um, just, just musicians. Uh, or if it is an artist, it's somebody who's also you know accomplished as a as a player as well. So they inducted, you know, Owen Bradley's A team. You know, they they which it, it kind of gets sticky if you say A team because sometimes people say A team still just as a term for first call Nashville session musicians. Right. But if you want to get really particular about what that term means, if you want to be like as conservative with that term as as you can get, you're talking about. Owen Bradley's first call session musicians that he called for DECA sessions, you know, and then they worked You're a lot right. for, you know, and, and according to Harold, you know, because he said who, according to him, was the A-team, and that's who was inducted in the Musicians Hall of Fame. It's Grady Martin, Hank Garland, Harold, Ray Edenton for guitar, Floyd Kramer, who, after he stopped working as a sideman, Pig Robbins on piano, Bob Moore on bass, Buddy Harmon on drums, and then you get into you know the the instruments that I mean really the A team too was also the Nashville sound. It was more guitar and piano, and then background singer oriented than it was right. hillbilly music. But then for steel guitar, you know Pete Drake, Tommy Jackson for fiddle, 
Charlie McCoy as the sort of auxiliary guy, whether it be vibes or harmonica or trumpet or right. electric whatever, bass or whatever. Whatever you know, Charlie, the, yeah, him he, tuning the the E string on Detroit City on Jerry Reed's guitar, you know, and yeah, that, you know, it's whatever needed doing, you know. He was there, and then you know, you get into the background singers. You got the Nita Kerr singers and the Jordan Airs, but as far as the players go, that's who. And Boots Randolph for saxophone for you know, because yeah. they did a lot of rock and roll records here too, you know, in the fifties with the A team that you know at the Quonset Hut. Um, so according to to Harold, that's the A team, right? And then beyond that, I've heard like Buddy Spiker, who's a little self deprecating, refers to the 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 company he was in as being the B team. I've heard Wayne Moss refer to it and Lloyd as the second A team because in '64 LPs be became the more dominant um, format, right? Over 45, over 45. Singles. So yeah. in the 45 era, an artist would need, you know, they do a four song session and that was enough for, for two 45s. And then all of a sudden artists needed 12 songs. So in 64, the, the, the session work became way more intense. You know, um, I remember Lloyd told me that he was talking to Weldon about, you know, you know, should I, you know, should I try to get into sessions? I don't want to step on anyone's toes. And Weldon was, you know, was like, we need players. There's more work than can go around. There's not enough players to handle the, the session work. So that's when, you know, uh, like Lloyd got in and, and Wayne Moss and, and Buddy Spiker and uh, Jerry Kerrigan and Kenny Buttry and, you know, sort of that, that right. era, um, Jerry Kennedy, you know, they kind of came in more in the early and mid 60s. Right. That's the that's the next. That's you know, the, the junior, next era. And yeah. that's when like uh, Junior Husky came in more, you know, Bob, you know, was already established and Junior kind of came in more as the the other bass player that you would, you know. And it was those are kind of the two guys up until Junior passed away and then Henry Strelecki came in. He was the first guy who was just as well versed on electric bass as he was on on upright. Right. And he could play, he could read and he was an arco player too, so he could play you know, uh, I didn't realize this. He is on For the Good Times. If you look at the card for, for the Good Times, Joe Zinkin is playing the, the plucked bass, but Strelecki's playing with the strings, playing bowed bass. So, you know, he was wow. a you know, versatile player in a way that they didn't really have before that. But, you know, when you get down to what the A team is, it's really Owen's original guys. Right. If you want to induct a small group of players in, that's what you yeah. nail it down to. And so, yeah, so through the years, the Musicians Hall of Fame has inducted all these different groups yeah. of players. The Wrecking and, Crew right. and the Swampers and, right. you know. And yeah. the Memphis Boys. The Memphis and on, Boys on and, and the, the Funk Brothers. And so you were inducted along with, with Kenny and the rest and Marty. With Kenny and Marty and Harry, yeah. yeah. Which yeah. was a, a real honor to, yeah. to be, you know, acknowledged in, in, yeah. in that company. With, with that band, you know, and then with Absolutely. all those other groups of players, too. Yeah. So. And so uh, today you've got a you got a session you got to get to with the Sierra uh -huh. Farrell. What else are you What else are you working on currently? Well, you know, friends and neighbors keeps me really busy. You know, I'm yeah. in the middle of trying to get a bunch of those done right now as well. So that's you know, 13 episodes a season. You know, and that's six months for a season. So um, uh, working on that, we're about to get started with Marty again. He's got a new record coming out a little later this year that we cut in 2020, and we've been kind of waiting for the right time to put it out for the you know pandemic to kind of go away enough that we could release it and that right. we could book a tour and, around and it promote and it yes um, so doing that uh, when i'm home you know chasing my 8 year old son around you know he's um, he he's eat up with music too he plays drums and he sings and plays guitar and uke and writes his own songs and uh, he's uh, but he also wants to make movies so we'll see you know I'm not sure what he's going to want to do. I guess he'll just do it all if he wants. Yeah, we'll His see, name's Ben Scruggs, and he's just, you know, he's, he'll listen to records in the car with me, and he'll just, like, identify every instrument on there. Like, oh, I hear drums, I hear bass, piano, and two guitars. Wow. It's like, it's pretty good. Yeah, that's right. That's what it is, you know? Uh -huh. Like, he, he, like he, he's, he's analytical about it. You know, he likes to get inside of the process a little bit. So he's, you know, a lot of fun, and I'm proud of the guy, so... You Maybe be. someday you'll have him on here. Who knows? Chris, let, let's let's talk gear. Of course, okay. I'm, I'm glad you have a telly with you because you yeah. I love Telecasters. This is a '62. This right? is a '62. It's got a slab fingerboard. It's been refinished. Um, the pick guard was, is not original. You know, these didn't come with gold guards on them. But I bought it with that guard on there, and it helps it stand out a little bit. Yeah. So I always know which one is mine. Um, this was the first nice, like pre CBS Fender I ever bought. I had a Music Master, a 62 Music Master before that, but this was the yeah. first, like, 
real one that like I the, got. The serious, the not a student model. Yeah, this was the first one where I stepped up my game a little bit and yeah. got this one. And it was, you know, it was one of those things where it was one of those really good deals yeah. where it just kind of showed up and I was like, oh my God, like I can't afford to not buy this guitar. And Where'd you get it from? I got it from, I think it was called Empire Vintage or Empire Guitars in Rhode Island, I think it is. Okay. Um, and, and then after I bought it, the, the guy who had consigned it there reached out to me and he gave me a little more of the history on it. He'd bought it uh, on like 47th Street at one of the shops in New York back in the 80s and it had belonged to like some heavy metal guy before him who played in some band that had some like small significance. It, it was painted black when he got it and then he had it put back to blonde. And it's just a, you know, 62 with a lot of changed parts and it's just a really friendly one. And I don't know, I think wood is kind of haunted. Like different guitars tell you how they want to be played. I'm not really usually like a twangy telly player, but this guitar kind of likes to be played that way. So I find myself leaning towards that on this one more than I would on Le another Le telly. Leaning toward what? The well, just like, like, like twangy, you know, like, you know. You know, this that kind of, you know, snappy kind of sound that is not usually what I go for even on a telly, but on this one it just kind of kind of leads me there. I don't know, maybe that's the 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 pickups. It's got a pretty bright bridge pickup. There are, yeah. I think Seymour Duncan antiquity pickups. It's just as it was when I bought it. Other than I had the body refinished by your neighbors at Bluesman oh, yeah. Vintage. They they did the cuz it had been refinished back to white blonde, but it was a real homemade yeah. kind of job and they they kind of made it a little more yeah. respectable so yeah they did a nice nice job on it yeah play some of the you know, were uh you know before before we you know turned the cameras on you were playing some nice you know twin stuff oh yeah were, just play a little bit of that for us a lot of what i've always worked up is, is try to do things just out of necessity you know and yeah and i love that sound of little jimmy dickens band in the in the 50s when he had you know walter haynes and later buddy emmons on steel and joel price on bass uh, who was the first person to play a Fender bass on the Grand Ole Opry was Joel Price. And he had the twin guitar sound of, you know, different, different guitars over the years, but in the mid-50s, the sound was Howard Roten, who did the arrangements, and, and Spider Wilson, who went on to be in the Opry staff band. Right. Early on, it was Jabbo Arrington and Grady Martin and um, um, Floyd Robinson, and there was a few other players. But that early Jimmy Dickens sound, which is so good. We were talking about this, too, yeah. when the camera was off that, you know, a lot of people, they just came to Dickens was just the, the old guy at the Opry and he was kind of funny and he was the little guy uh, with he, the suits. With the jumbo guitar to, to make him look even smaller and, oh, oh, and, and uh, yes. A lot of people kind of took him for granted, I think. He kind of just became, after Acuff died, the old timer at the Opry and people didn't acknowledge the power of his work. I mean, he was a star. He was, yeah. you were saying you saw Buck Owens backstage at the Opry. No, this, this was at Buck's place. At, this, okay. this was at, at the Crystal, at Crystal Palace. Palace. Okay. So uh, yeah, uh, Jimmy was, was with Brad Paisley mm -hmm. and they were, and they were in the little backstage area, which is really more like a, a you know, a, a locker room yeah. kind of for the kitchen help. And Buck came in and almost bowed down to Jimmy Dickens. Mm -hmm. And you just realize that it's like, wait a second, this is Buck's, one of Buck's heroes that he looks up to. And it's like, I, cause I had been around Buck a number of times and I'd never seen him yeah. soft and, and, res and that level of respect and honor that he was placing on another Dickens person. Dickens was a big deal, you know. Yeah. And, and I wish that people made more of a fuss about, about that. Like on this, I mean, as, you know, as, just as much as Ray Price or Farron Young or, right. or Hank Williams or Lefty or any of those guys. I mean, Dickens was, and he lived so long, I think, that, that people maybe didn't revere, and he was so accessible. Right. Because he was at the Opry all the time, like an Opry star supposed to be. Right. You know, he was there every week. Yes. Yeah, and I think people took him for granted. Yeah, I think it was almost a curse that he was that uh, yeah. available, so people didn't, you know, because he didn't there die. There was no elusiveness, young. like, or Carl right. Smith, who became reclusive, and, you know, right. Carl Smith, oh, I, I saw him, he was, you know, at the Steak and Shake, and frankly, he was, was Goldie right. with him, yeah. yeah. You know, there was this, like, it was like seeing a, like a ghost or something, but with yeah. Dickens, everyone just kind of, you know. Right. Yeah, he was down home and accessible like a country star's supposed to be. Right. So, but, uh, yeah, you were saying, uh, I was playing Sleeping at the Foot of the Bed. Yes. You know, so often, it, you, you um, you have to get the job done on like either like we were saying with Clarence White playing steel guitar licks on a guitar or sometimes like with a lot of that Dickens stuff was all about the twin guitar sound. So I've, I've worked up uh, sleeping at the foot of the bed on one guitar, which, you know, is and it doesn't sound as good as two guitars, but it, it, it gets yeah, the, it gets the, the, the job notes done. So, but. <laughs> He 
Did you ever sleep at the foot of the bed when the weather was whizzing cold? When the, you know, so on yeah. and on from there. So, yeah. but that's just a fun, yeah. fun little thing to do. So parlor trick. Uh, yeah, great parlor trick. So talk to us a little bit about. You know, because of course, guitar styles yeah. changed a whole lot during this period of time, and so you're kind of showing this this early to mid '50s guitar style. Yeah, and then it's you know with lighter gauge strings and bending, and things changed drastically in a yeah. short period of time. Because yes, you had some of these guys playing Fenders, but a lot of they were also playing. They were playing with thirteens on them, you know, and, and right. flat wound strings a lot of the time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the the big shift happened, of course, with James. You know, James yeah. Burton because he would take a set of strings and he would throw the low E string away and then he would bump everything down so what was the A string became the low E right. and what was the D string became the A and, and then he needed something for the high E so he would take a banjo string and, and which was a, a loop end and put, put the him. ball end and then feed that through the back yeah. and that's where the 10 to 46 set came from. You know, People notice if you get a set of 13 to 56 strings it's the same as a set of tens if you just take the 56 off and add a 10 on the other end of it. Right. So that's that's where the the slinky set came from that yeah. Bernie Ball ended up packaging right. in the, I guess, late 50s or early yeah, 60s. Yeah, early 60s. Yeah. And he didn't even make his own strings in the beginning because he didn't have a, a factory yeah. or anything. So. And that's the thing. You couldn't get individual strings back then. I mean, Jerry Bird used to... Um, he used to beg the string manufacturers to offer individual gauges for, for different steel guitar tunings. Right. And they didn't. They just had their stock sets, and you had to buy multiple sets and throw strings away and add strings from here and there just to make it work. And yeah. I don't think they changed strings a lot back then. Yeah. Because they were they were poor. You know, I remember asking Caps once, man, you moved to town with a gold top Les Paul. Why did you sell that thing? He said, because it was the wrong guitar for when I worked with the Lubin Brothers. And right. back then, you couldn't afford, if you wanted a new guitar, you had to sell the one that you had. Yeah, that... that when I interviewed Reggie Young, it, it, same kind of story. Yeah. And this was, you know, a, a decade later, mm -hmm. and he was talking about in the '60s the same kind of thing. He couldn't afford to have multiple guitars, yeah. so it's like you you sold or traded in the guitar you had for another one. Yeah, and that's just the way it went. And if you needed something, so what I wanted to get to was that you know, of course, you play the Stone Fox Five, mm -hmm. and so it would be tempting to use modern techniques and such in, in soloing and stuff, but that really takes it out of, out of that. So do you, do you instruct like Kenny or is, is there just kind no, of an Kenny overall? Knows that, st that style is basically just, you know, kind of playing like a, like a swing oriented Charlie Christian type player. And Kenny's really well versed in that. You know, he took lessons from Johnny Smith right. as a teenager. You know, so, and then, you know, other players that play with us, people like Andy Reese, and, the, you know, they understand that that sort of Grady Martin, you know, style of that era, yeah. which is very much, you know, in, in, informed by, you know, swing electric guitar players yeah. who didn't really bend strings, and it was more about voicings, and it was more about, you know, flatted fifths, and, you know, those nice in-between notes, instead of bending, you know, play yeah. the in-between notes instead of bending, you know, to fill the space in between the notes. Right. What uh, what gauge strings do you These use? These are 10 to 46. I used to use 11s, but then I started acquiring and letting go of guitars at a much faster rate, and it seemed to make sense just to play the strings that came on guitars, which is usually 10 to 46, so I, I kind of stopped with the 11s. Okay. And then I found that, you know, it's kind of nice. I don't do it a lot, but to bend the high E string a full step, yeah. you know, and not have it sound strained, which I don't really do that a lot. You know, I, I'll bend it a half a step. Um... But yeah, I just I just use tens usually on a Fender guitar. I'll use elevens if it's on a Jaguar or something with a shorter scale. Yeah. On Gibsons, I usually use elevens. On something like um, like I've got a like if it's like an archtop electric, like a one seventy five or something like that, I'll use flat wound thirteens. Yeah. Um, if it's like a Gretsch, I guess I could go in a few different directions depending on if you want it to be a rock and roll instrument or you know more of a sports coat and tie kind of a guitar. You know? Right. Um, any so, yeah. brand preference? Uh, Diodario, for the most part. Yeah. With flat wounds, a lot of times I end up using labella strings. Yeah. Um, I just like how polished they feel, you know. Yeah. And picks? Picks, uh, whatever. I, this one says truetone.com on it. I think I found it. <laughs> I'm really picky about picks. <laughs> yeah. I, honestly, with picks, if it's just like a medium plastic pick, I'm, I'm not that fussy about picks. Yeah. I, I had a shell pick for a while that I would use on my flat top and arch top acoustics You're if I'm a real one yeah yeah but even in the studio usually on a flat top I'll use a thin pick because it cuts through the mix a little bit better and that's right. what 
Jimmy Capps and Ray Eddington and yeah. those guys would always do. That's the best EQ ever. Yeah. Is to use different picks Man, on acoustic. You know, I mean, I, I, I don't make a big deal about picks until it comes time to get a different sound, and it's just nice to have a bunch of different picks. I mean, you can get five different acoustic guitars out of one acoustic guitar and five picks. Yeah. You know? Let's, uh, let's get out your, your, uh, your, your steel. Yeah, okay. All right, now we have the double neck out. Yeah. How about you play some of that behind the bar bending? And, okay. And well, in the old days, you know, steel guitar didn't have pedals. It was just, you know, board with strings on it, and the players would kind of play, you know, the... There's a bar slant there, but there's another bar slant. But uh, when pedals came out, you had the sound of some strings staying the same and some, some strings moving right. the note. And Kate and Roberts, who I learned from, had developed a style where he would pull the bar behind the string so you can kind of get that. You know. That almost it has that Ralph Mooney kind of. Yeah. You know, so you can kind of, and then for, you know. for the swingy stuff too you can get some you know you know major seven nine chord get your flat a third into a third there so there's a lot of stuff you can do with with that you know yeah that's... bluesy stuff as well as the the country you know Kind of thing too. So yeah, you can you can. <laughs> it's amazing how much you're able to pull out of out of that. Yeah, you know, with, without the pedals. Yeah, yeah. Caton used to joke and say, "God gave me a pedal right here." So, yeah. <laughs> but you know, I'll pull the the. It's C six. I'll pull only the the, the plain strings for the most. And yeah. The E is just a half step, and the the next two down a half step or a full step. Yeah. <laughs> and for for various, you know, depending on where I'm located, you know, it might like this could be. Me getting the the major third, or that could be you know like um, it could be could be for a diminished you know or you know there's there's different applications for each yeah. pole. So yeah, it, it reminds me so much uh, interviewing Ray Flack, uh -huh. and, and Ray Flack said, you know, he held up his hand and said, "This is me, Benda." <laughs> <laughs> Because it was, you know, during the era of where he had, you know, kind of helped popularize the hot Telecaster uh -huh. picking thing on the Skaggs yeah. records, and then everyone was using B-benders to play what he did. Yeah, great. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, you can use the tone control for, you know, like the Speedy West, Elvino Ray type. Yeah. The and that, I mean, that can, you know, that kind of fell out of fact. To me, that was the steel trying to emulate a horn section, you know, da da do da yes. da you know that was what yes. they were going for there and that fell out of fashion by the time pedals came around because the big band era was completely gone by then uh, but there's still space where you can do stuff like that on yeah. a steel if you just think outside of what the application yeah. used to be for a sound you know I'll use techniques like that that where I'm not trying to sound like Speedy West on a Tennessee or any Ford record but if it's right. like you know, like if there's something that's like a, like a like a funky groove to it, about you know, there's there's stuff that you can do, yes. and and also just viewing the steel not just as always just an, like an either on or off lead instrument, but kind of like you know, there's different things you can do with it beyond beyond that. Yeah. And when you're playing without pedals, you kind of sometimes have to find. You know what else can I be doing right now? Yeah. You know, and you don't always want to sound like a country instrument. So, you know, sometimes it makes sense just to think. You know, how much potential is there in a board with strings on it? And that's what's always tickled my brain about this instrument is how much can you get out of so little? I mean, it's just a board with strings on it. You know, and with the volume and tone control. With the volume and tone control, yeah. 
Yeah, and the doo wah thing, and thinking of it as a horn section, that you know completely makes sense. Yeah, in in that application of it. Or it'll yeah. get, I mean, you can turn the the tone control completely off and get you know. It's almost like a world. It could be like a Wurlitzer piano, or right. Caton used to do a lot of effects with the side of his finger. There was a style that uh, Billy Robinson started where he would play with, with uh, on the Opry. If there was like a square dance tune, Billy would go kind of emulate a banjo. Joe yeah. Talbot used that sound on a lot of Hank Snow's records, so then Caton would use that sound with Hank Snow. Because right, he was touring with him. Yeah. yeah. But then Caton would also sometimes turn the tone knob off, and because Snow also had a lot of Latin. You know, tunes with like Latin and rumba beats, and Caton oh. would turn the tone down and then get. It's almost like marimbas. It's like, right. like you right. know, or turn it up and then you get. You know, You know, that kind of, there's a lot of effects, and in, in solo, it doesn't, it kind of sounds like a funny thing, but when you put it in a mix, it can kind of fill an interesting space, or percussive, you know. You know, there's different yeah. different things that you can do with it, other than just play steel guitar. You know? Yeah, and there's, well, and, and this just goes to, uh, to really put forth, you know, the point that, Really, the only limitations are your own imagination. Absolutely, and, yeah. And also the fact that you know not having pedals is not a limitation, and not, and also the fact that you're going to able to get so many sounds without using effects. Also, yeah. Sometimes without even using a bar, you know? right? Or Just, open chimes, you know. You know. You know, there's there's a lot you can do depending on what key you're in. Right. There's a there's a lot to of, to be had out of out of this thing. So, yeah. what are some other unusual ways you've you've used these on on used this on sessions? Yeah. Um, I don't know. It'd be good for putting your charts on sometimes. <laughs> um, I don't know. Just you know, it, you know. Sometimes, like I was saying, with rolling the tone knob off, um, you can you know almost sound almost like a horn. You know, if you. You know, you can kind of almost sound like, you know, or, and then there's, of course, though. Yeah. Almost like a trumpet with a mute, you know, which, you know, can kind of be a little corny in the wrong place or it can make it right. in, the, in the right space, you know. And then, you know, Jerry Bird with Hank Williams would do a lot of that kind of, yes. you know. You know, it almost sounds like a like almost like a train whistle, you know, or of course if you really want the train whistle you can you know, you can, you know, really you know, you can you know there's there's sound effects in there too. <laughs> it's not all music, sometimes it's just fun, you know, but yeah. um I don't know, there's a there's a lot you can you can you can get out of it. Yeah. Sure. Tell us about this great old Martin. This is a 59 D18. I bought this off of my friend Wes. Uh, and he named it Gene, the D18. Okay. And uh, he would loan it to me a lot because I really liked it. And I would use it in the Stone Fox 5 and then he decided to sell it. So I got a hold of it and I love this thing and I would use it all the time. Um, it, in uh, the old days, when they first started cutting sessions a lot in Nashville, everyone tried playing 28s. But they quickly found that 28s had too much low end. They right. were too loud. They would bleed onto the other musicians' mics. They'd get in the interfere with the bass and the left hand of the piano. So it was an official thing that they went to playing D18s because they sat in the mix in a better spot. The mahogany guitars did. So um, so this is my D18. Uh, I've got a, a few, but this is the one I use the most, and it's just a. 
Yeah, I think it's a good one, you know. It's a, it's a great one, and we were talking about the fact that the, the strings are, are older. Yeah. And, and that gives it more of that fundamental sound mm -hmm. instead of the, the, the brassiness, and so I love the, the purity of it, you know, the old guitar. I was saying that, yeah. you know, somebody told me uh, that, you know, with, with new strings you hear the strings, with old strings you hear the guitar. You hear the guitar. And I think that's a, you know, I mean, there's a time and a place for, for new strings, but there's something nice about old strings, and I love old records, and they didn't change strings a lot back then, and yeah. it's thumpier, it sounds thumpier uh, when, you know. Yeah, sounds fantastic. So Thanks. is this the guitar that you uh, that you front the Stone Fox Five with? Sometimes, lot? you know, I have a couple fancy looking ones that I'll use too. I, I've got yeah. a J two a nineteen fifty J two hundred with a pick guard on top that T K Smith made for me with my name inlaid on it. That yes. looks kind of like like uh, Lefty Frizzell or Hank Thompson's Bigsby pick right. guards that they had. Right. And um, you know, I've got a, a D eighteen a sixty that's got a, a big custom black pick guard that looks you know like big fancy hillbilly tone killing pick guard on it that was on the guitar when I bought it right so but uh, I use this one a lot this is the loudest cleanest sounding one I have so if I need to be heard you know this is the one that speaks a little bit so more. So is used more for sessions? And, I use it for sessions and yeah and for live stuff where I'm going to need to cut through it doesn't have a pickup on it so but I can put a mic on this one and, and still kind of you know cut through the mix in a moderate volume setting so I like it Gene the D18. So. <laughs> So show us uh, some of, of what you would call the you know the, the rhythm style in which you would play with like with the Stone Fox Five. Okay, well with with uh, on this guitar and that band it'd be m more open chords. Yeah. Like when you listen like to Hank Williams' record, like kind of what he's playing more right. the. thing like Hank Snow, it might be a You know, that, that kind of a real plunky, kind of stiff lead guitar sound, that, that yeah. defined Hank Snow sound, and I love it. But, you know, it's, it's a, you know, you kind of dig in. and Now, he would always use fresh strings, and you can hear it on his records. You can hear that he changed strings like that day, you know, or the night before. You know, he was, you know, kind of, you know, <laughs> Always I'm made sure that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. his his outfit, his uh, yeah, his, everything was in place. Let's his, just his, say his wig, everything was yeah. in place. Yes, so yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's a fantastic guitar. Thanks. What, what else should we know about it? Um, I don't know if there's too much else to to know about this one. It's got a lot of cracks, and it's I guess a left-handed person at one point. It's got a hole here from a strap pin, which okay. wouldn't work with a right-handed player. Right. Um, I think this is all from me. I don't think it had that when when I acquired it. I should maybe play a little farther up there. When I that's from playing live with it and, and digging in and you know you know from so I should probably ease up down there a little bit. But it's just a it's a nice one, 1959. And then you know it, it's interesting. At what point did everyone start moving the strap button from instead of using the yeah. uh, you know the rope around the well, end of the, the you know headstock. the guitar was not intended to be played standing up originally. And you know, a lot of old guitars don't even have a a, a pin down there. That right. The, I don't I, I don't know even when that started. Maybe that was with archtop guitars just to anchor the tailpiece. Or I'm not I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. Right. Um, but I, I think people were just trying to find different ways. If you notice in the the 40s and in the early 50s on archtop guitars, a lot of times they would anchor both sides of the 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 strap down here. Right. And they would have it go up and over their shoulder. And then it would go down, and then it would wrap around here, and then continue up through there, and then double back and lock there again. Like, there's that iconic picture of Hank Williams and the Drifting Cowboys. And I think Sammy Pruitt's playing, I think he's playing an L5 uh, elect with a McCarty floating pickup. And you can see the strap go over there. Or you see Billy Bird with Ernest Tubb, and he's got the strap right. kind of wrapping around there. That was one way to have the strap anchored there. I guess it gives you more control. It doesn't wiggle around as much as when you do it down there. Yeah. Um, you know, 
I'm fine with it either way, but um, you know, this doesn't have a, a pin on it right, right. now, so and I why, put one on. And why drill an extra hole yeah. if you don't need to? If it's already got one in the wrong spot, why put another? So Yeah. All right, let's grab the O5. Yeah. All right, this is a, a beautiful arch top. Tell us about Thank you. it. This is a 1938 Gibson L5. Um, this was originally owned by a guy named Elmo Tanner, who was the vocalist and whistler for the Ted Weems Orchestra out of Detroit. Um, you can't really probably see on the camera, it's pretty faint, but his name is inlaid in the truss rod cover, Elmo Tanner, and that's factory Gibson work. And his initials ET are in the, the end pin here. And the, and the sides are just amazing. Oh my gosh, yeah, beautiful bird's eye maple. They would not have used this on an L7, you know. And then the back is really pretty too, but the the sides in particular just really are really, really nice bird's eye. And I love these. Little uh, hillbilly strap pin there. Yeah. They used to, Bigsby would use uh, strap hooks like that too. And, and the thing was is that guys would use camera straps as their guitar strap. Right. And then clip them on. Uh, back to the conversation about, you know, how to stand with a guitar. Um, so this guitar... Uh, was uh, one that I acquired when I turned 30. I kind of bought it for myself as a 30th birthday present. And uh, and this is, you know, in the old days, when I was saying before they had drums in, you know, Nashville country music, a lot of times you'd have, and I demonstrated on the, the flat top, you'd have the flat top going. Which is not really the way you play one of these. You know, you play closed chords on an arch top. So you have the flat top doing that. And then the arch top is going. And that, that offbeat gives you, that's what the snare drum would be, you know? Right. There's your snare. Yeah. yeah. And that's more the hillbilly way to do it, you know, on, on two and four, you, know, you have that hard chop there. Of course, you know, like Freddie Green in the Count Basie band, he was, you know, it was a little more. It was a, a smoother sound, you know? But in, in Nashville, like Jack Shook, who played on a lot of the Hank Williams records, and, and, you know, Ray Eddington, when he started, you know, he became more of a, more of a flat top strumming player later on. But when he started out and, and Velma Smith played in L5, the, the sound was an arch top playing that sort of chop style. Yeah. Almost like what a bluegrass mandolin does. Exactly. But, but, you know, yeah. in a lower range. Right. Yeah. That's, that's a beautiful instrument. What are, you know, what are some other ways in which you would use that instrument, like on a, on a session or? You know, for the most part, I mean, I, I mostly use it for that kind of stuff, either the swingy type feel or the, yeah. the, the sock rhythm kind of thing. Um, or sometimes just if it's the other guitar that I have just to kind of fill a different range. I remember Richard Bennett explaining once that, you know, a, a flat top guitar fills, you know, this much space, but an arch top fills this much space. Because it's, it's a, you know, it's a, the, the mids are more pronounced and there's not as much boomy low end like with a flat top. Right. So you, you could use it for strumming. This isn't the best one for strumming. This was, you know, this is, by this time Gibson had switched to um, parallel bracing and this guitar was meant to cut through in a big band doing... <laughs> That kind of style. The earlier L5s, which were X-braced, are a little more versatile for like, you can kind of strum it like, like that's what Maybell Carter did. Was she, she played an L5 and she strummed open chords, you know, the. Right. You know, you can do that a little more convincingly on the, the earlier X-braced L5s, but this is kind of just a, a big band machine, you know, it's a, or a hillbilly snare drum. Yeah. Whichever way you want to look at it, either yeah. something very prestigious and elegant, or something that's just real down home and it, keeps the square dancers happy. It's got a little more push to it. It's got a little more thunk to it, uh, when, it you, when you when you hit it. It yeah. does, yeah. And, and this is a particularly creamy sounding one. Gibson, uh, it had factory work done in the fifties. Uh, the top was, you know, kind of like thinned out in some spots and tuned, you know, from the inside. Andy Reese loves this guitar, and I, I'm proud. To, one of the few things I'll just flat out brag about is he says, that's the best L5 in Nashville. And I'm like, yes, yes. thank you, <laughs> and from, Andy. And from Andy, that's a high compliment. A com yeah, any compliment yeah. from Andy. He's a very discerning fellow. So, <laughs> you, you are correct, sir. Yeah, he does not, he does not, uh, he doesn't sugarcoat it. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> but he likes Elmo, so. Yeah. Well, Chris, it was a real honor to have you down. Uh, just Thank you so much for, Thank you, for your, having you. you know giving giving us some of your history, giving us some country music history, you know your your instruments. It was it was fantastic. Thank you, Zach. Thank yeah, you so much. It's been a pleasure. Yes.